My name is Michaela Hunter and my pronouns are she, they, and I am a queer, non-binary white settler who works, lives, studies, and plays on Treaty 1 territory and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. I am also a graduate student in the Department of Community Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba, where I'm involved with a number of important research teams and advocacy initiatives. My thesis research focuses on exploring the primary healthcare experiences and needs of underrepresented 2SLGBTQI plus young adult patients. And by underrepresented, I mean those who have identities that are outside of the ones that we more commonly hear about in the research literature. So for example, lesbians and gay and bisexual men. In addition to my thesis work, I'm also the lead fellow for Spectrum, which I'll talk a bit about more later. And I'm also a research assistant for measuring equity and generating action in cancer, or Megan Can for short. With Megan Can, right now my focus is specifically on how sexual minorities are defined in cancer care research to uncover who and who is not currently being talked about in this research. Although my academic endeavors keep me busy, I always make time for important advocacy and community building initiatives for the 2SLGBTQI community. Most notably, I am proud to say that I am the founding president of the Queer and Trans Health Sciences Graduate Student Group at the University of Manitoba. This group offers a safe space for queer and trans health sciences graduate students to present and get feedback on their work, develop friendships, and advocate together for inclusive academic practices across the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. And this group was officially ratified on July 20th, 2023. Spectrum stands for Social Policy Evaluation, Collaborative Team Research at Universities in Manitoba. Spectrum brings people together to use data and lived experience to inform how we can become a fairer and more just society. We share a commitment that we can achieve more by working together than what we could alone. I've been the lead fellow for Spectrum since 2021. Spectrum, in my opinion, truly exemplifies the importance of community engagement and policy creation. The partnership consists of academics, community organizations and individual community members, and government representatives. By including all three of these key groups from the very beginning of the research process, we can make sure that we're asking the right questions and developing solutions that are both feasible to implement and effective for those who are ultimately impacted by the policies developed. When community engagement occurs only at the end of the research process, you risk missing out on important insights that could have helped to shape your research questions. It also means that your results or solutions may not actually be what people want or need. Research partnerships like Spectrum engage community, government, and academics early on so that we can draw on knowledge that each group has to develop policy options together. The way I see it, community engagement and policy research can only make the work all the more meaningful and impactful. I had to think a lot about this question because there are so many sage words of advice I've received over the years. The one that really stands out to me that I think youth need to hear is that you don't know what you don't know until you know and that's okay. It may sound a little confusing, but considering I've heard it countless times from my mom, it's actually a really good way to understand learning. Let's say you're going to write a test and you're confident that you know 100% of the answers. You get your grade back and find that you only got 60% correct instead of the 100% you expected. Before you wrote the test, you didn't know which answers you didn't know. When I'd get a grade like that, my mom would always remind me that you don't know what you don't know until you know and that's okay. And that really helped me to stop from being disappointed in myself when I was just really in the beginning stages of the learning process about a certain topic. Not knowing those answers wasn't necessarily a bad thing. What it really meant is that there was more that I could learn and I really couldn't have possibly known that before I had written the test. This piece of advice from my mom was really helpful in helping me to reframe the way I viewed less than perfect outcomes. Instead of viewing those situations as failures to be ashamed of, this advice helped me to see them as opportunities. It's through embracing mistakes and seeing them as a chance to learn more that you can really grow your knowledge about something. To say that there are many pressing issues facing youth would be an understatement. 
We're living in a time of unprecedented climate crisis, economic uncertainty, and where the human rights of some groups of people are being called into question. In my lifetime alone, I've been alive to see the Twin Towers destroyed, the 2008 financial collapse, and the COVID-19 pandemic that brought the world to a standstill, and that's just to name a few things. Of course, there's also been some wonderful things that have happened, like the legalization of same-sex marriage in Canada and the creation of the Paris Agreement. As wonderful as those last two things are, it still concerns me as a young person to see the state that we're in today. Roe v. Wade was overturned in 2022, and although that is an American example, it's very much impacted how we talk about reproductive rights in Canada as well. And the same is also true for the over 500 anti-trans bills that have been written in the United States in 2023 alone. And we're starting to see things happen like that here in Canada too, which is admittedly terrifying. So such examples include things like the new parental inclusion and consent policies announced in Saskatchewan at the end of August. As a gender diverse person myself, and for other trans and gender diverse youth like me, this makes our futures uncertain. It's a difficult prospect to grapple with, and one that will assuredly be the front of mind for many youth in the weeks, months, and years to come. There are, of course, many other pressing issues to talk about that I can't possibly cover all of them in this clip here, but just to name a few of them, there's the issues of the lack of affordable housing, discussions about livable wages and safe consumption sites for those who use drugs, and then of course, very importantly, is the lack of access to safe drinking water for a lot of Indigenous communities still, and in 2023, that's just not acceptable. And in addition to all of that, we really have to talk about the climate crisis. In the words of Greta Thunberg, our house is still on fire. And for as long as we don't make significant progress to repairing the damage done to our environment, our house will continue to remain on fire. And unfortunately, it's really hard to consider raising a family in a house that may or may not withstand the flames of climate change for much longer. For me, one of the most misunderstood, or perhaps not sufficiently talked about, aspects of equity is intersectionality. Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw developed this analytical framework of intersectionality to understand how a person's various social and political identities combine to create different kinds of discrimination and privilege. We're more than just the sum of our parts, and so different identities shape the way we experience the world and the way the world treats us. For example, as a white person, I have never been discriminated against because of the color of my skin, and I have been afforded privilege in a society that privileges white people. At the same time, I have also experienced discrimination because of my queer and non-binary identities since I live in a society that favors heterosexual cisgender people. Further to that, I also have the privilege of a white queer and non-binary person. It's a little difficult to go into too much depth in this short video, but the key point here is that all three of those things are true. I have privilege as a white person, I am marginalized by my queer and non-binary identities, and I have privilege as a white person who is queer and non-binary. I have many other identities than just those, which only further complicates my identity and my experiences and the way that I experience the world and the way that society is, or in some cases, is not designed to support me as a person. Intersectionality plays a key role in equity. So for example, when we think of concepts like gender equity, historically most remedies for this inequity have been considered in the binary sense. That is, we want to lessen the gap between men and women. It seems simple on the surface, right? But like I just explained about intersectionality, there's far more to it than that. The experience of a black woman and a white woman won't be the same, nor will the experience of a trans woman when compared to a cis woman. Dr. Crenshaw has notably pointed out that most policies designed to support women typically support white women. I would go a step further to say that those policies are largely to support cis white women and not any other kind of woman. So when we're thinking about equity, we need to think about it in that holistic intersectional sense. We have to think about it from different identities, from different perspectives, to make sure that we're actually supporting those that the policy is designed to support. If I can leave you with anything, it's really the concept that equity for some isn't equity at all.